Welcome to Through the Ringer. I'm your host, Tate Frazier. We got a very fun remote show today and joining us in an undisclosed location. He is the great cousin, Sal. Sal, good to see you, man. It's great to see you. I will disclose the location at the end of this episode <laughs> yes, and give someone tease. a chance to win a television set. I don't oh, know what man. I'm doing. Yes, we're going to figure it out. I like that. Uh, we are very excited. We have a lot to get to on the show. Uh, Robert Sala was supposed to join us today, but he will not be on the show, unfortunately, oh. Sal. Hopefully we can get him back for the next few Wednesdays. That was the big news of the week. The first coach fired is officially here. We're going to get to, you know, my favorite game and first Tate and all this other stuff. But first I want to get to to you know, the New York Jets. They have an opening. They, they have an interim head coach. How did you feel about this news, Sal? I, you know, I got blindsided all along. I was like, <laughs> Peterson's going to be the first to go. He's definitely, you know, he's going to be 0-10 or whatever for his last 10, and that'll be it. And then just like that, Robert Sala tried to take Aaron Rodgers' boyfriend away boyfriend away from him and uh that's a no-go yeah he said no nat you will not take nat hackett away yeah. from me and uh now they're still together and uh you know aaron Rodgers got rid of his problem he pushed him out quite figuratively and literally one time on the sidelines we all saw that so uh there's a lot happening in new york we're going to talk about that but first and foremost let's talk about first tate because i got some takeaways from this week in the nfl and i first say to you sal Cincinnati this season is more disappointing than the new Joker movie. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, pretend to announce, uh, you know, pronounce that in French, but you know, the new movie that just came out, uh, the Joker take. two, and uh, what did, what did you call it? What's the name of it? I, I didn't tell you, say anything. I mean, you didn't take seven years of French for nothing. Your parents are going to be disappointed. You can't right. do this. Yeah, I know, but it, they are the most disappointing team, and this movie apparently is very disappointing with the musical aspect. I don't know all the details. I haven't seen it, but uh, a fully a dud is what I would say it is. Uh, but what's that you, Sal? What's worse? Fully a dud? Fully a dud. I think that's I like the name. That. Yeah, that's a good Is one. Is it fully a zoo? And I would say I have not seen it either, but I can't imagine anything more disappointing than the Bengals, who I, I didn't see the Joker, but I don't, I don't know if there are any winners at the end of it. No mm. winners at the end of this Bengals season. I'll say this. Watching week after week, Zach Taylor, Lou Anarumo come up with scheming for to give up 38 and 40 points, and Joe Burrow, one of the best quarterbacks in football, is left hanging I would think the Bengals would have a worse Rotten Tomato score than the Joker. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Maybe we put that up there uh, as their first four games, and we'll see what people think about what's happening. God. My next one for you, Sal. First Tate 2.0. Uh, I say to you, Kevin Stefanski should have to return one of his Coach of the Year awards. Obviously, he's gotten that honor a couple of times, but he should give one back because he's not doing a great coaching job right now. There was the big to-do, uh, the big uh, you know social media cycle of Deshaun Watson apparently going off the field. Obviously, it was a 12-man penalty, but just in general, Stefanski has lost complete, complete control of the Cleveland Browns, and uh, my guy John Fanta is going to have a heart attack if they keep playing football like this. So, uh, what are your thoughts on the Cleveland Browns and Kevin Stefanski? Well, I think he has lost control because the owners are telling him, you have no control over this quarterback situation. We're playing mm. Deshaun Watson. I mean, it's the only thing that makes sense. They made the playoffs last year, Tate, without Deshaun Watson. In fact, they had four or five quarterbacks that did it. They know there's a path to success for this specific team if they don't show uh, start Deshaun Watson, who clearly, I don't know how many weeks in a row he has to have a QBR in the <laughs> seven, eight range, but it's disgusting. It's laughable, but I have to think the only reason he's playing and it has nothing to do with Stefanski is the owners want to see him get mangled on the field, <laughs> much like he helped them mangle that contract, the worst in sports. Yeah, you think it's a kind of punishment, maybe. They're just getting him out there, letting him get hit. Maybe that is the uh, the, the, the silver lining of this whole situation. Uh, last I think that's one. It. Yeah, Diabolical. That's a, yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. Pretty smart. Uh, last one, uh, last first Tate. I say receiver's revenge is a real thing in the NFL. We just saw it with Stephon Diggs. He said it meant so much to him to get the win against his old team. Uh, DJ Moore made my Carolina Panthers pay. That was my big pick. I thought Andy Dalton was going to get a win against the Panthers. I, I went on the Ringer pregame show. That was a bad pick, Sal. Uh, uh, but I, I'm going to point to injuries and act like that's the problem there. But the receivers, that's the big story. Both these guys get their revenge. And uh, it was fun to see the actual emotion come up for both these guys because they felt like they got, you know, jaded and, you know, kind of stepped over. And now they get to get their revenge. So that was fun to see. How did you enjoy the receivers revenge? Well, first of all, I was right there with you, Tate, with the Panthers upset special. Maybe our, our upsets are in college. That's where we, <laughs> that's we right. shine. And we're going to mm -hmm. we'll hit you with those uh, in a little bit. But. Yeah, I'm all for this receiver revenge, but aren't isn't, doesn't this piss off the quarterback a little bit? It's like, hey, in any other game, um, you catch one out of every three passes, I throw <laughs> you away. Now, but because you're playing a team that let you go for more money, you you need your revenge. You're gonna all right, okay. 
Maybe can you uh, hopefully you you have revenge games against 30 other teams because this is uh, not the way to play football. But, yeah, I guess I'm all for revenge games after seeing what happened on Sunday. Yeah. Speaking of not knowing how to play football, there's another note I just want to point out here. Uh, North Carolina and NC State are right now uh, a combined 0 and 10 and two against the spread this season. So, uh, you know, just bad football all around. <laughs> I, they need some receivers to find some revenge. And uh, that game will be officially do- uh, down the toilet bowl when they actually play in November. So North Carolina I and think, NC State. I think they need the Department of Justice to look into <laughs> this. I mean, I think Carolina just became kosher gambling wise in March or April, right? And now yeah. all their teams are like they're they're winless against the spread football mm. wise. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, the FanDuel. It's a lot of fading happening. I, there's something right. going on there. We'll see. We'll, we'll do some research. But uh, Duke even lost a game. So Al Duke was the only hope in North Carolina, but they lost. Uh, so now everybody is licking their wounds in North Carolina. So North Carolina football, not a place we want to talk about. Maybe a hockey state. We'll get to that a little bit later. But now we get to play my favorite game. We're going to play over under reaction. Sal, are you fired up? Are you excited? It's made, much, much better in the Let's studio go. when we get to you yes, know, dab I each know. other I'm up. I'm not as I'm still ex- excited. fired up as you are, but I, I do like this game. <laughs> Let's well, do it. Speaking of fired up, let's talk about firings. Uh, the first one, Sal. Firing Robert Sala isn't going to fix the Jets over or under reaction. What say you? You don't think Jeff Ulbrich, the great Jeff <laughs> Ulbrich, you, you, you were Ned singing Hackett? his praises yeah, when he was on. a linebacker's coach at, uh, at Atlanta like four years ago? You don't think that's going to turn things around? Uh, I don't think it will. I, I think there might be some excitement Monday night when they play the Bills. But the cameras are going to catch Aaron Rodgers side-eyeing um, this Elric guy. Look, he's going to give him the stink eye. And it's an old quarterback who makes poor decisions on and off the field. Like, unless they hire his ayahuasca supplier, <laughs> I don't see any change in this team anytime soon. Yeah, or maybe Robert, uh, you know, RFK can get in there and be the head coach. Who knows? There's a lot of options they could go for. Yeah. I think by the end of the season, Aaron Rodgers will be the head coach. Uh, I think he will be the offensive coordinator, the head coach, and the quarterback. So uh, he will be doing everything with the New York Jets. Let's talk about another AFC East team. I say to you, Sal, this is from Bill Simmons' mouth. Uh, he huh. said, the Patriots are the worst team in the NFL. Is that an over under reaction? What say you? You heard it right from my mouth. <laughs> Drake May. Well, now Drake May is in, right? Yes, so he's in. Get to see it. I Against a great defensive line, that. Sal. Yeah, that was a smart time to put in the young rookie. Just let him get crushed by one of the oh, best D lines yeah. in football. Yeah, that's good. Home, home against Miami, who you know is only going to score about 12 to 15 points, would have mm-hmm. been the time to put Drake May in, not against uh, Houston. But you know what? I still like the Titans to take the spot. I'm going to ignore your team. I think you get maybe four wins by accident, Tate. But uh, I mean, Will Levis, I think, is a miracle to for betters. I really do. Um, <laughs> the they're going to have trouble the rest of the way. Yeah, they have the Bills, they have the Lions, they have the Vikings, they have the Texans times too. They play New England on November 3rd. That could be a big game to see who has the fewest wins at the end. But I think ultimately we're going to see like four teams have three wins with one week left. Yeah, I like the Titans there. That's plus 750 is the number. The Patriots are the favorite at plus 230. But, uh, yeah, I like the Titans as well. Um, Let's keep it pushing here. We got the Washington Commanders have the best offense in the NFL. Sal, they've been great. Jaden Daniels, if he had told his punter at the start of the season he doesn't need to do too much, we'd be looking at him like uh, (laughs) the greatest quarterback we've ever seen. He should have taken the words out of Caleb Williams' mouth. But right now the Commanders are unstoppable in offense. Are they the best? Is that an over or under reaction? They may have the worst punter. We'll never know because we only (laughs) We see him like once a month, but Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, Jaden Daniels is phenomenal doing it with his legs, making a superstar out of Terry McLaurin, 114 points in three games. I'm trying to think of which offense I'd be more afraid of, Tate. I think this is an underreaction. Maybe the Ravens at their best, and then these two teams play each other. And we're going to go over that matchup when we return from commercial. We'll be right back. Oh, no, no, we're not ready yet. Oh, no. I was excited. I was going to watch some John Gruden film while he watches Jaden Daniels film. Uh, I'm okay. cutting your favorite game short, Tate. No, yes, I think they do have the best offense right now. Well, let's talk about another team in the NFE, NFC East. Let's talk about your team. The Cowboys saved Mike McCarthy's job and their playoff chances on Sunday night. Dak with the heroic dive and then the big fourth down conversion. Is that an over or under reaction, Sal? Um, man, I think it's a proper reaction because I, right, I don't yeah, know if they, they saved his job because Jerry Jones, you know, he could maybe take a page out of Woody Johnson's uh, ancient book here. You're allowed to fire guys if they don't step up, but um, played a great game. He outcoached Tomlin. The, the flip side of it is had they lost a game where they out, you know, performed 445 yards to 222, then McCarthy would have had a lot to speak for and it would have been trouble. But 
Uh, I mean, they would have stuffed them in a Pimanti sandwich and, and shoved them home on a bus. But as it is now, I like the Cowboys' chances to at least get like a seven seed. The fact that we're doing it on the road is a good sign. Yeah, I like it. Uh, modern philosopher Matthew McConaughey is right to say the NFL is trying to make mm. us fat over underreaction. What say you, Sal? Underreaction. I can mm-hmm. only speak for my fat self here as I sit here. Um, you know, before I got into football, I was walking around like Terry Crews. I right. mean, I was you know, like you a show the pictures. Yeah, picture. right. Yeah. But the Dan Campbell Applebee's ads, the constant <laughs> uh, eat like a king at Burger King. I am like taking a, a bite of something before every snap of the Sunday night game. It's atrocious. It's disgraceful. Screw the the NFL <laughs> stands for nonstop food league, I think, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and they got great food at the game, especially if you go to SoFi That's Stadium. So, yeah, yeah, they got tons of great restaurants. Yeah, if you're not getting <laughs> punched in the mouth, you're filling it with a, a you know a chili cheese dog. And it's sometimes good. it happens at the same time. Same time. Did one bite right. and one hit, you know, it's the whole thing. Yeah, you have uh, to use the food. I use a churro, actually, <laughs> in a defense uh, posture. So it lot, out. Lots of ways to use food uh, when you're watching football. That's a good thing. Uh, I say to you, Sal, the best catch on Sunday belonged to Padres outfielder outfielder Jerickson Profar, uh, mm. who decided to kind of con all the Dodgers fans and acting like he didn't steal a home run, and then to gleefully show them the ball and uh, have them completely dejected. Is that an over or under reaction? It was pretty good. You know, I'm still not sure he caught it. I never saw the <laughs> ball leave his glove or him throwing mm-hmm. it back into the infield or whatever, or throw it wherever he ended up throwing it. Ultimately, he gave it to the fan who then chucked it on the field, but uh, great catch, and it may have started uh, a West Coast war here. I mean, people are lining up all along the 405 to do battle with each other, Padres and Dodgers fans from Chavez Ravine to Petco Park. So this could end ugly, but great catch, Jackson. Thank you. You did great for uh, for relations here in Southern California. It does feel like there's going to be some sort of fight in Temecula over what is happening in the series yeah. at some point. So we'll keep an eye on uh, on what's happening in that series. Uh, next one, Sal. The Big Ten will have more teams in the college football playoffs than the SEC right now. Uh, you know, Oregon, obviously a minus 800 team, uh, Penn State minus 250. Uh, so a lot of Big Ten teams are right there. Uh, what say you? Is that an overreaction or underreaction? Yeah, obviously Ohio State's in there. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I, I'm i all right. I'm going to say overreaction. I still think SEC gets the nod. Both teams should get three in. But I feel like ultimately the SEC will have five teams battling for four spots. You'll have Georgia, you'll have Bama, you'll have Ole Miss, Texas A&M doesn't want to lose now since uh, Notre Dame. And Tennessee, I know they look bad against Arkansas the other day. But I think those five teams will fight for four spots and they'll actually get it. Now, if Alabama keeps allowing like 12 points a quarter (laughs) on defense, uh, forget everything I just said. Yeah, well, let's talk about Vanderbilt uh, because they had a big weekend. Uh, this was an incredible upset that we all saw on Saturday. So I say to you, South tossing goalposts into the river is the victory trend in college football. Um, obviously, you know, this is something that they did. They walked it all the way down Broadway Street, and uh, mm-hmm. it was quite the spectacle there in Nashville. Is that an over or under reaction? What say you, so? Well, you know, I'm going to say overreaction, you know, I, but I do wish I didn't even have a football team in college. I went in upstate New York, Oswego, and there was a big lake, Lake Ontario. And the, the closest we came to throwing a goalpost is throw my friend Harry and I threw three dozen uh, half eaten wings into the uh, lake there. So I don't <laughs> think that counts. Where are the cops, by the way? For the, the, if you're marching three miles, they were down ushering the them along. Yeah, they were they were giving <laughs> them an this escort. Way? This is the way to do it. It's yeah. like payoffs right there. I don't know. I, in a way, it's kind of fun. I don't mind the goalpost thing as much as I do like teams running on the field. Vanderbilt should have. They were like you know a huge three touchdown underdog. They hadn't beaten a top five team in sixty games, so they're good. But if a three or four point underdog goes on the field, I, I, I can't stand it after a win. And I do want to see like a follow up outside the lines. Like, how does that affect the wildlife in the river? Like, how does it, yeah. you know, do we have to buy a new field goal post? Who does all this sort of logistical stuff? But it was fun, the visual of seeing it all. And uh, another fun visual of seeing Ashton Genty in the backfield standing like Mike Myers. Uh, I say to you, yeah. Sal, Ashton Genty will win the Heisman Trophy and America's Hearts this season. Ooh. Is that an over or under reaction? I th- do they have a separate ceremony for America's Hearts? Is <laughs> yes. it four finalists? Meg Ryan is the host of the <laughs> show. It's a reality show now. Everybody's Perfect. watching it. Like it's great. It. Yeah. I think he has a better. I think it's an overreaction. I think he has a better chance of winning America's Hearts. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think. If you double his totals right now, 35 touchdowns and over 2,000 yards would be spectacular. But 
the Heisman Committee frowns on the blue turf, Tate. They're racist mm. against blue turf is what the problem is. Now, <laughs> I, I, to me, I really I think right now it's time to invest in Cam Ward, Carson Beck, maybe Dylan Gabriel, guys who are going to probably play in big championship games. Mm. Um, I'm right there with you, but plus 220 right now is Ginty is the favorite. 16 yeah. touchdowns in five games, but uh, like you said, even Travis Hunter right there still feels like someone that's going to be in that conversation late in the year. Last one, Sal. Sal will bet a player prop parlay, including a LeBron over and Bronny under during the upcoming NBA season. Ten days away, over or under reaction, Sal? I think that's an underreaction. I will definitely have Bron, LeBron, Bron. I mean, an in-game spanking, twelve to one odds, uh, scolding him for staying out late with his friends. Without he tosses texting. Bronny himself. He gets yeah, he yeah. gets grounded during the game. That'd be great. First well, grounding be, of the season. Yeah, first ground in-game <laughs> grounding. grounding. There you go. <laughs> oh, there you go. Uh, yeah, the, the fun thing is it's going to be LeBron and Bronny total points over twenty-three and a half. Like, yeah, well, LeBron averages twenty-three. And the sun averages a half. So that's how mm-hmm. we're going to have to do that. But yeah, I do all we need is one brownie basket. That's all it takes. That's right. One breakaway layup and we hit over. So uh, mm-hmm. maybe we get in on that together. Let's call up the Riverboat captain. Let's do some prop culture, Sal. This is a fun one. I say to you, which NFL personality would you least want to sit next to on an eight hour flight back from London after mm. a loss? We have the odds right here. Aaron Rodgers, two to one. He's the favorite here. We got Doug Peterson, uh, Mr. Ice Cream himself at five to one. Brittany Mahomes, uh, seven to one big dom of course uh eagle security guard 30 to one and we got the field at even odds what say you sal wow this is a tough one if you mm-hmm. say like which one i would want to sit there the most it would be Diz ha- uh d haslam Diz haslam that would be d haslam for <laughs> yeah. sure i mean she uh, has a great football mind i'd love to pick her brain for eight hours uh, talk mm-hmm. about the league but the least i would say i'm gonna go big dom you get big odds for big dom at 30 to one because I think he'd be annoying. First of all, he'd elbow me <laughs> into the uh, into the glass there, right there for eight full hours. Um, I feel like he would uh, also like worse than Russell Wilson doing high knees in the aisle. I think he'd be like curling. He'd probably take me at one point and curl me into the overhead compartment. And he's got the worst gas in the world. That's, he's notorious for having bad gas. So those three things make me want to say Big Dom. Yeah, the bad gas, uh, 30 to 1 odds. Those are great reasons to go with Big Dom there. I think I'm going to go with Doug Peterson at 5 to 1 just because I think at some point he'd realize I was co host with Lombardi when Lombardi <laughs> had said what he said about him. <laughs> we have an awkward plane ride the entire time where he's like, I hate this guy. And, you know, he probably needs an outlet to get his frustrations out. He probably turns on me. So I'm going to go You're the one who fed one. Lombardi that <laughs> yes, nonsense. Lombardi right. liked Doug Peterson until you're the one who filled his brain with crazy thoughts. I, I led him to that. Uh, so right. Doug Peterson would figure that out and that would not be a fun ride for me so i'm going to take him at five to one i don't like the odds but i don't like the uh the odds on me having a fun ride if he's right next to me so that would not be good uh that is a fun riverboat prop we're going to take a quick break when we come back we're going to do some line look aheads and subtract to the futures with cousin sat we'll be right back Welcome back to Through the Ringer. We're still here with Cousin Sal, and we got a lot to discuss. We got some line look-aheads to get to, Sal, and we're going to start with Thursday night football. We got the 49ers taking on the Seahawks divisional game here. Seahawks plus three and a half in this one, the total 47 and a half. Who do you like on Thursday night football, Sal? It is a good one. I don't want to say both teams are reeling, but they kind of need to win, right, to right mm-hmm. the ship here. I thought this would be San Francisco minus one and a half. It is three and a half, as you said, higher than I thought. Um, I guess they're thinking it's a must, must-ish win for San Francisco. This is a team, though, that doesn't typically give their full injury status until Friday, right? Like Kittle seems to need most of the week to recuperate. Charvarius Ward, Fred Warner, all these guys. So this might be too rich a line, Tate, for a division battle on a short week in a hostile stadium. As bad as Seattle looked, I think they can compete and keep this close. I will say just a general thought uh, on Thursday Night Football, Sal. I mean, nothing makes sense. Logic does not come does not come into right. uh, the, the equation. Aaron Rodgers even looked good on Thursday night. <laughs> right, yeah, you're exactly. right. Like, yeah. it d- doesn't make any sense. So anytime that you're trying to bet or make sense of Thursday Night Football, usually zag uh, when your mind is saying you should zig. That's just my own uh, kind of mm-hmm. overarching thought on Thursday Night Football. But you do like a player prop in this game. There's probably more value value in the player props in these types of games than it is uh, and the actual outcomes themselves. Yeah, well, this one moved against me. I like 
Brandon Ayuk under. It was 65 and a half. Now it's 62 and a half receiving yards. I'm still going to take it under. I've been doubling up on him, Tate, to score a touchdown every week, and it's just not going to happen. He won't do it. He refuses. He doesn't care. He's like, you know, $120 million. Take your time, Brandon. Take yeah, your time, right. Brandon, by the way. The T-shirts <laughs> I'm going to be making up, uh, it's going to be sell big in yeah. uh, the red states. But I uh, like yeah, that. Take your time, Brandon. <laughs> seven of his last eight games on the road went under this total. I'm going to short Ayuk, so expect three long touchdowns out of him. Yeah, there's a lot of owners that are watching Brandon Ayuk, and they are just uh, saying, I'm going to use this material next time someone's holding out for a contract because he That's got right. his contract that he wanted, and uh, he has not been the option. He's probably about their fourth or fifth option right now, it yeah, feels like, no on kidding. offense. So, And they don't even have Christian McCaffrey on the field so I like the under there I'm gonna go Jackson Smith and Jigba anytime touchdown plus 195 it does feel like Geno Smith is kind of turning to him a little bit more as a security valve um, and I think in this game it might not be in a winning game but it will be a game where he gets a touchdown so I like the odds there plus 195 and if, eventually Sal one of these have to hit uh, one of my NFL picks so not maybe really this is the that's first not guy. the case it, no. it, it isn't it's not yeah come on no. I've <laughs> told you about my friend Harry right it's now 11 years hasn't picked one right hey well I'm happy for Harry that he uh, got his Syracuse win. So uh, he didn't right. get to see it in person, but at least he got something. Uh, <laughs> let's track to the future here, Sal. This is a fun one. Coach of the year in the NFL. The odds on this have uh, shifted dramatically, it feels like, week by week. There's a lot of whiplash. Guys shoot up the board. Guys move down the board rapidly. At one point, Jim Harbaugh was the heavy favorite. Now we're at the point where, uh, you know, Kevin KOC in Minnesota is the, is the favorite. But you like someone else to be coach of the year, Sal. Who's your number one guy? I went with Dan Quinn the beginning of the year because I picked Washington to make the playoffs. It was a lot richer than plus 330. I feel like there are like four or five in consideration, and it's Quinn and, like you said, KOC in Minnesota. So you have to think if both of them make the playoffs, who gets it? It's going to be very close. I, I, don't, I don't imagine the Vikings will keep up this. They're not going to go undefeated. But if they're 12 and 5 and, you know, Washington is 10 and 7, I, I would still give it to the Cowboys' former assistant coach, especially. You know, if they could stay on top in the top three offensively with a brand new quarterback, I'm going to give it to Dan Quinn. I do wonder, though, if Cliff Kingsbury is going to ultimately steal his coach of the year, Thunder. Mm, yeah, he's going to get credit maybe as the coordinator of the year, and they say right. he's the reason why. There could be some of that as well. As a Dallas Cowboys fan, Sal, do you miss Dan Quinn? Just to, as, an, as an aside, before we move on to more track to the futures, do you feel like it, you know he kind of took something away from the Cowboys? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I just feel like, uh, you know, our, our team doesn't really resemble what it did last year on either side of the ball. So I don't want to give him any cre more credit <laughs> or um, more uh, hash than I should. <laughs> That's fair. That's a divisional rival now, not a friend. Yeah. Uh, friend to foe quickly. Uh, let's do another fun one. Win total wars. We got Jets versus Steelers. Uh, they're both at eight and a half. What do you like here, Sal? Because uh, obviously the Jets, there's a lot happening with that team, a lot of movement uh, as far as the coaching staff. And uh, I'm sure Aaron Rodgers' expectations will be you know, either raised or lowered depending on what we see uh, in the next few weeks. Yeah, this is good. So we're pitting two teams who have the similar, you know, adjusted or whatever, you know, updated win total. The Steelers were at eight and a half to start the season, right? Mm -hmm. So that was a big thing. Like, oh, my God, I could have Tomlin to get to nine and eight. He's never under 500. Well, you could have started right here. The Jets were at nine and a half. Now they're eight and a half. And before Salah even was fired, I even I had this under. I, I just think it's going to be tough for the Jets. They have the Dolphins twice and the Patriots one more time. By the way, that Patriots was Rogers' only real impressive game. And then the others, there's not an easy game on the board, Tate. They could lose all the rest as far as I know. They still haven't solved the running woes. Not sure what happened to Brees Hall. I'm going to say the Jets end up 8-9. Yeah, I'm right there with you. And I also think that all the fantasy football prognosticators need to owe all of us uh, an apology for Brees Hall. I don't know what that was. He was so high on every board. And uh, if you invested in him and Christian McCaffrey, it's been a tough year for fantasy owners. So I uh, just want to shout Kill, that out. Tyree any of yeah, those Tyree top Kill, five. Bijan right. Robinson hasn't been great. You know, like, uh, like C.D. Lamb, I guess, is the one of the top six picks that could possibly, you know, pass for uh, legitimate at this point. Mm-hmm. I don't know how that works. And then next year, we'll see the same list of guys in the yeah. you know, exactly. whatever similar order, and we'll all you know, fall yeah. for it again. McCaffrey That's just what was happens. probably not a good pick. Yeah, right. it was a lot. Right. It's a lot happening. Uh, let's talk about our sport that we own right now. We are college yeah. football sharps. Uh, let's do some college <laughs> football upset specials here. Uh, who do you like, Sal? Last week, you hit Syracuse plus 190 over UNLV. Who do you like this week? And you at SMU plus 195 over Louisville. We have not right. lost since we did this. <laughs> since we started this way back. 
back. Mm. I think it was October 1st. You can look back. We have not lost. Uh, I'm going to go ASU plus 188 over Utah. Cam Rising. Cam Rising for Utah, not even a game time decision anymore. Tate, it's like a halftime decision. Like <laughs> right. you, you, you definitely, there's no, no, you need even more than warm ups to see if he's going to be in. And the replacement has not been very good. Meanwhile, Cam Scadabo, Tate, 182 yards in the team's win against Kansas. That's rushing for Arizona State. He's rushed for 619 yards in five games. I think he keeps Utah honest here. ASU is, you know, the desert is where favorites go to die. ASU 4-1 and one and unbeaten at home. They're going to add Utah, who already lost to Arizona. The Utes go down at Sun Devil Stadium. That's my upset pick. Yeah, and this is an old Pac-12 showdown here. You know what I yeah. mean? Or, you know, our new Big 12, however you want to look at it. But this will be a fun game, and I like the Sun Devils in this one, plus 188. I'm going to go just for a rivalry. I just think there's going to be an upset here. We got the Red River rivalry, one of the best rivalries in college football. I'm going to take Oklahoma and take the Sooners. I'm going to take a big swing here, wow. Sal. Wow. And, and probably, you know, th- this may hurt us being 1-0 uh, as our college <laughs> football sharps, but <laughs> why not take a big swing? Anything happens in a rivalry game. Texas has all the pressure. They have all the expectations. This is kind of their first time having that going into this game, being a number one team in the country. So Oklahoma plus 500. Give me them over the Longhorns, even though I love it. I feel bad for Brian Curtis. He's going to make me arm wrestle himself. This happens. He's going to be very upset. Oh, you don't want that. You don't want that. (laughs) All right. And our underdog streak just ended with Oklahoma over Texas. That's all right. It was fun. It's fun. Hey, we were one to know, though. That's all that matters in history. We were (laughs) one to know. That's what people will remember. Uh, Another line look ahead. Let's flip the to baseball and talk about playoffs we're in october right now so uh we yeah. got the guardians at the tigers tigers plus one and a half in this one the total was seven uh series is tied at one to one right now it's been a lot of fun De- detroit is a very likable team but uh what do you like in this game uh sal you got some uh, fun props to look at i'm going guardians lane thomas uh two mm-hmm. or more total bases he's had a hit in nine of ten road games he's five for 15 against the tigers pitching with four rbis and you have a lane thomas uh, is, was he the only player available? I think for a so. Prop? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What do you have? They only have Lane Thomas props, so that's why we have to go with this. I'm going to take Stay Lane Thomas. Stay in your Lane Thomas here <laughs> Stay, with these props. Go Stay ahead. in your lane. Uh, new segment coming out. Plus two twenty. Uh, I'm going to get him to steal a base in this game as well, Sal. So Lane Thomas, we have put all of our eggs in one basket. It is the Lane Thomas <laughs> basket, and uh, if he does not deliver, he will not be uh, highlighted on this show yet again. So Lane Thomas, yeah, yeah, we will never talk about him again. So Lane Thomas, pressure's on. We'll see what happens at this one let's look at the other game uh we got the yankees taking on the royals royals plus one and a half the totals at eight uh again series tied one to one these are a lot of fun series here uh well you got a prop you got a fun prop in this one as well so bobby witt you look at his home away splits and it's almost like something's up you may people may be you know blaming the wrong kansas city team for cheating but he's 0 for 10 so far in this series i think he comes home and gets a single he has 13 hits in the last 10 home games. Nine of them were base knocks uh, as one off of Clark Schmidt this season. So he's going to add one to the total. Minus 130. I like it. Minus 130. I'm going to go. I'm going to swing for the fences here. Literally, Aaron Judge home run. You can get that at plus 280. I just feel like the discourse has really turned on Aaron Judge. They're like, this guy's no showing in October. The Yankees fans are all upset. And it feels like the time to, uh, you know, just you know, quiet him down a little bit. So Aaron Judge gets a home run. I actually think they lose the game, but Aaron Judge... A little false good. hope here, um, but, you know, right, plus I'll 280. Go for that. so, that's yeah. good. If you Aaron, lose and he, he hits a home run, He hits a home run, but they lose. Yeah. There you go. So that's a, a little caveat there. Uh, next one, we got hockey starting. NHL is happening right now. Just started on Tuesday night. Track to the future, Sal. We're looking at the 2025 Stanley Cup winner, and you got someone that you really like here, and you like the odds as well. Who is it? Yeah, the Panthers, 10-1. to 1. Mm. Remember them? They did pretty yeah. good last year. They have top <laughs> eight scorers back, uh, including Sam Reinhardt, who got an extension. Matthew Kachuk's always good. They had 88 points. Alexander Barkov had 24 points in the postseason. Bobrovsky was a finalist for the Vezina Trophy. Run it back, Panthers. 10 to 1 odds. Double digits. Yeah, I like that. Uh, the Oilers are the favorite at plus 850, but I'm going to go with my Hurricanes, Sal. And uh, yes, that's another homer pick, so it probably won't happen. But Hurricanes plus 1400, why not? They uh, have the, to. The, you have to be good in some sport. <laughs> yeah, it has to. to happen at some point. Football's <laughs> dead. Uh, we're worried about basketball. So let's take the Canes plus 1400. That would be good. Uh, and this is a year, Connor McDavid, can he win the Stanley Cup? That's always, I feel like that's the big question every single year. So I'll ask you, Sal, do you think he can do it? 
No, Tate, I'm picking the Panthers. Why aren't you listening? <laughs> oh, yeah, Go that's back. right. You got to yeah. rewind this. Dude. Yeah, let, yeah, this let, me, let, me, yeah. let me get a listen back on that. Okay, right. So he's not going to do it. Uh, last thing, Sal, before we let you go, we're going to do the Tate debate here. Um, this is just something I, I, I've i seen, you know, uh, you know, kind of in the ether a little bit, but I do think we're at the time where it can happen. I say to you, Sal, coaches should be able to challenge Miss penalties on the field if they can point out and explain the missed call that they're talking about whether it be a face mask a hold whatever it is offensive defensive pass interference any of sort of stuff illegal formation uh, mm. a pick on a pick play maybe it's a different color flag obviously you got the red flag right now maybe it's a blue flag i don't know what it is um but i do think the coaches should be able to challenge one missed call because these refs they got a lot to watch out and i think they do miss some stuff cough cough in some of these chief games um right. so I, I say it's time that we let the coaches actually challenge challenge an official call what say you what say me i, I say i was doing a, a podcast at 2 30 a.m <laughs> on the east coast because the games already went long because of lightning strikes and now we're going to scrutinize uh tape over whether or not an offensive lineman put yeah. his hands underneath the pads or didn't put it uh, i don't know tate this is a long way to go so that you could see a, a blue flag <laughs> I just want to throw a blue flag on the field. You know what I mean? <laughs> All right, we'll get you a blue flag. We have to extend the game 25 minutes? <laughs> yeah, we, I, have to, I have to create a new coach's challenge so I get a blue flag on the field. Uh, there you go. It. Uh, maybe, maybe it's Carolina blue. Who knows? We'll see. We'll figure it out. Something's got to stand out out there. Uh, but that is the great Tate debate. Uh, it's something that we're always looking forward to every week. <laughs> Sal, we're looking forward to you, to you on the show. Where can we find all your work? And then we'll let you go enjoy the rest of your day. Against all odds, twice a week on the Ringer Podcast Network. Cousin Sal's winning weekend Friday. I'll have Jeff Schwartz and Brother Bry will be on. And the Ringer pregame show Sunday right here on FanDuel TV. I don't think I'm going to be asked to back on that show after my last pick. <laughs> Good so, for you. So I'll just be, I'll, I'll be watching in the future. I hope everybody else is tuning in. Sal, you're the best. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to have the Ringer's very own Anthony DeMundo. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Through the Ringer. Uh, shout out to Cousin Sal. He just hopped off. He's got to go watch some baseball and stay locked in. And joining us now to make sense of what's happening in baseball, he is our Ringer Sharp himself, Anthony DeBundo. Welcome back to Through the Ringer, man. Good to see you. Good to be here. We're in the middle of a crazy sports period, but really, like when your team is involved in, in the playoffs, <laughs> like there's a certain level of like extra just drama and it's eating away at me slowly. Yes, yeah, Sal did say we needed a truce here. He did not talk about the Mets. Obviously, the Mets and the Phillies. You're a Phillies guy. Uh, they are facing off right now. So he did not, you know, bring up anything positive about the Mets. He did not try to do any voodoo, any reverse jinxes. So he's hoping that you will live up to that same level and that same bargain. So I just wanted to pass that on. So uh, make sure uh, we're, I, all, we're I, on the same I page heard here. Him. I heard him say filthies on uh, on, no. on Bill's pod. So, you know, uh, I've, I've taken note and I'm going to be the better man. I'm not going to say anything. Yeah. I'm just going to say, let the let the baseball decide. It's good to be, it's good to take the high road. I think uh, as we've seen, uh, we, we've learned that along the way. Uh, we're going to talk about the Yankees. Carlos Rodon, he stuck his tongue out um, and then he had a fourth inning from hell to follow up on that. So uh, taking the high road sometimes can be a good thing. We'll get into the minutia there. I want to start talking about the Guardians and the Tigers. Uh, obviously this series is tied up one-to-one -one right now. And, uh, you know, we got a matchup here. Tigers plus one and a half. The totals at seven runs. What do you like in this game three and what, what should we be looking forward to as we get to Detroit? Yeah, these are the two run prevention machines left in the baseball playoffs. I mean, you mm -hmm. saw it on full display in game two where Steven Kwan's making diving plays and Tarek Skubal is turning into a cyborg where nobody can hit him. And and so all of these teams are just so, these two teams especially, are so optimized to prevent runs. And so I bet under seven in game one, we pushed despite a couple errors that cost us. I bet under six and a half in game two and back to the well, game three, I'm taking some under seven. Uh, you know, I, I don't even care who starts for the Detroit Tigers. They, they are going to mix and match their pitching. They are optimizing their defense much better than they were early in the season. And this offense is still a below average unit. Going up against the Cleveland bullpen, it's very hard to, for me to see how they score consistently. And if you look at it, like Emmanuel Classe gives up the three-run homer to Kerry Carpenter. Other than that... Even against like Cade Smith and these other guys in the Cleveland bullpen, they just haven't had looks. You mentioned the Royals. Let's talk about the Royals. We got the Yankees going uh, to face Kansas City. The your Royals in this game, plus one and a half. Totals at eight runs. Uh, what do you like in game three, Anthony? I like the over eight. Uh, I call it Coors Light 
That's my new nickname for Kaufman, uh, mm. the stadium that the Royals play in. It has played as one of the friendliest hitter parks in the league this year. And uh, I could get into like all the science behind it, but essentially like the, the bar, the ballpark is very friendly toward batting average on balls in play. Uh, and the way that the pitches are moving, it's, it's different this year. It's playing like a different park, much more hitter friendly. And I think it's real. And uh, I do think for that reason, the total opened as low as seven and a half. I have it closer to eight and a half, uh, almost closer to nine even like I'm between the two. So I'm way low on this or I'm way high on this total. Uh, and I think that this game has the potential for offense and it is a very interesting dynamic where the Royals offensively this year at home, one of the best teams in the league did not travel as well with the bats. I also don't know how much I trust Clark Schmidt in this spot. I mean, I'm guessing the leash will be short, but uh, there is some question about his splits in the past. He's had problems against lefties and we'll get into that in a second, but uh, I do like the over here. I think the total's a bit low. Fascinating series because the Royals have their ace waiting in game five. If I'm the Yankees, like I'm not going to feel good even with the split, even coming home to the Bronx. It's like, man, we got to face Cole Reagans again. So the Royals are in a very interesting spot now having stolen a game in the Bronx. Yeah, and Yankees fans are sweating everywhere. Uh, they are very worried about what is happening in this series. And uh, like I said, I mean, uh, Rodon was on fire early in that in that game, and, you know, the crowd was into it, and, you know, he's sticking his tongue out at the bench. And that fourth inning, it might be a fourth inning uh, that is a nightmare as we look back on this series. What player prop do you like in this game three? Yeah, I'm going to go to my guy, Big Vin Pasquantino. Uh, over one and a half bases, plus 140. Mm. Uh, one of the big things that happened with Schmidt this year is he did get better at getting out lefties, but his best pitch is a sweeper. And for those who don't know, like sweeper is like basically a slider. It's kind of like the new age slider. It's a little more horizontal than it is vertical in terms of how it moves. And it has a big platoon split. So when Schmidt throws that righty split, the sweeper, the lefties have generally done well against it. And, uh, you know, Vinny, I think, obviously Bobby Witt is their MVP. But Vinny is kind of the linchpin of this offense because the Royals are a free-swinging group. They like to kind of just go for it. Vinny is very patient. He takes, uh, he has excellent plate discipline. Like he doesn't swing outside of the zone too often, and he is kind of a really important hitter because in the month he missed with injury, he came back just this week, last week. Uh, they were one of the worst offenses in the league, and since he's come back, they've they've clawed some runs back into this into this group. So, uh, Wits, of course, their MVP, but. In terms of like underrated X factor, it's Vinny Pasquintino, uh, great personality as well, and, and a fellow. And a great na- yeah, and a great name, yeah. I mean, yeah. just uh, just the best. Uh, you love to see that. Uh, I'm looking at futures here. I did want to ask you just uh, from your st- you know vantage point, how do you feel about looking at the futures for the World Series? Because if you look right now on FanDuel Sportsbook, New York Yankees are the, still the favorites, even though we were talking about them sweating. They're plus three forty. Dodgers right behind them, plus four thirty. Then the Phillies, your Phillies at plus four fifty. Padres plus four eighty. Do you start? looking at futures do you start you know based on what we've seen look and see if you can get some valuable odds before things kind of shuffle out and teams fall out of favor how do you feel about that i've told pretty much everybody i know since the playoffs start like just keep betting the padres mm-hmm. i think they're gonna win it um, yeah. they're deeper they're pitching their bullpen their lineups really rounded into form they have a balanced group i think all the nl teams might be better than all of the al teams right now no offense to you know yankees <laughs> fans but i just there seems to be a gap to me in pitching depth and pitching quality in the National League. And even the Dodgers are kind of on the short end of that. Uh, We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk some football with Anthony DeBundo. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Through the Ringer. We're still here with Anthony DeBundo, and we have figured out the MLB playoffs, at least the game threes ahead. Uh, but we now want to talk about the NFL. We got week six, week six coming up. It's a very fun slate, and uh, Anthony DeBundo is here to help us make sense of it all. Uh, you and I were kind of on the same page a couple weeks ago. We were ta- you were talking about the Bills, and they were one of your highest rated teams. Uh, they have <laughs> fallen off. It's been complete free fall uh, ever since uh, they went to Baltimore, and they're still trying to figure things out. Now we get the Bills taking on the Jets. The Jets are actual free fall right now. They have a new head coach. Uh, there's a lot of shifting things happening, including the line. The line is now at plus two and a half. The totals at 41 and a half. What do you like in this game? And uh, we get a divisional matchup, an AFC East showdown between the Bills and the Jets. Yeah, I mean, my Buffalo is the best team in the NFL after three weeks take has not aged particularly well. Well, uh, I was right I'm there kinda... with you. I, I don't know what to do with it. I'm just like, I remember seeing that and I was like, I'm, I'm right there with you, AD. And now I'm, uh, I'm, I'm confused. I don't know what's going on. 
Well, it's always nice. Like, so coming into the season, I thought the Bills kind of like people were down on them and I thought it was overblown. So mm-hmm. after three weeks, I'm like patting myself on the back, like, great <laughs> job. You were right. They're not, they're, they're still very good. Uh, and now after the last two, it's like, can they even convert in a first down against a team who's going to play man, spy Josh Allen and just make it really hard for this offense right now? I mean, Sh- is Shakir the MVP of the team because they, seem to have no way of beating man coverage without him and i don't know how they beat this jets coverage unit without him or with him at this point i mean i think there's some real concerns about the bills offensively um i did think they played much better defensively in that game against houston especially you know once collins went out and they were able to kind of take advantage of a limited team without a ton of weapons and that's kind of what the jets are i know garrett wilson's great but after that you look around you're like wait you know mike williams and alan lazard and Conklin's like found the fountain of youth a little, but this offense is pretty limited as much mm-hmm. as we love the two guys that went top 15 in every fantasy draft. It's like after that, I don't know. So I, I did take some under 41 and a half and uh, you expect a fully motivated jets group, uh, you know, with, with uh, Ulbrick coming in for Sala. But uh, for me, this game is going to be a grinder and, and when in doubt, I mean, the jets play as slow as anybody in the NFL. So that's always nice for the under the bills take away explosives usually pretty well. And I don't think there's any way this Jets offense gets explosive in this game. Yeah. Do you think the loser should get Devontae Adams? Is that how we should view this game? That loser makes the trade for Devontae Adams? Because the Jets, uh, that's Aaron Rodgers' guy. It does feel like Aaron Rodgers. If you're his guy, you're safe with the Jets. We just saw that with Salah. There was some inklings that he wanted to get rid of Hackett. Hackett says not so fast. He's still there with Rodgers. Rodgers might go get his receiver. You mentioned weapons. Is that a weapon that they need in New York? I mean, everybody could use somebody like that, right? I mean, the Chiefs, <laughs> the Chiefs, even though they got a, a the Juju Ravens, legacy game Monday right? night, like they could use them. The Ravens, I mean, uh, it, it is interesting because the price could could really get m- the Raiders could get more than they're prob- than he's probably worth, just because of the fact that there's all these AFC competitors that are in the in the mix, and it really comes down to like, you know, the Raiders would they trade him in the division? Mm. I, I say the Raiders are so bad it doesn't matter, but uh, they might feel differently as the team who actually has to live with that decision. So yeah, I feel like Antonio Pierce would enjoy that just to have to play Devonte Adams. I think he wants to line up with him one on one. Triple team, him, triple team him every week. Yeah, he's gonna have like them. a longish yard moment, like Burt Reynolds, and check himself into the game to guard him. You know what I mean? I think that uh, that could be where we end up with that situation. Let's keep it pushing. Let's talk about the Detroit Lions taking on the Cowboys. Cowboys plus three in this game. The total is fifty two and a half. Uh, obviously, Dak just had his moment. I, I honestly think the dive on the football after the fumble was almost more impressive than the fourth down conversion that he had but Dak had his moment now he's going to take on the Lions this should be a fun game what do you like here you know Dallas's offense is kind of following the same script as last year very quietly and I think it's interesting Mm -hmm. because uh, last year they had a pretty sluggish start first few weeks they went into the bye they had an early bye and they kind of changed things they used a lot more motion they were using lamb all over the formation and they were one of the best offenses in the NFL after week four and they've now posted back-to-back weeks with very good success rates against the Giants and the Steelers. And those aren't elite secondaries, but you know I think we widely regarded Pittsburgh as a very good defense like three weeks ago. And so if you think that this Dallas offense was moving the ball up and down the field on them, and I still have major question marks about this Lions secondary. I think it's a very flawed unit. So I actually did take some Dallas plus three and a half, three, uh, three even money, three and a half minus 115s are out there. I think... Detroit will be able to run the ball. They'll be able to lean on Dallas, no doubt about it. But, I mean, just think back to last season. Dallas was laying six in this spot at home. So we've had a nine-point adjustment between week 17 of last year and now. That seems a lot to me, even with Dallas having some injuries. So um, I've got the better quarterback catching a full field goal at home against a pretty average to mediocre secondary. Uh, I'm going to take Mr. Dakota there <laughs> shout out to Dak Prescott I like that uh he's getting some momentum now and he's also getting some support in the media we love to see still that. having <laughs> some dumb turnovers I'm a Dak I'm a Dak truther like I've loved this guy for years I had him MVP mm-hmm. last year like but the, the the turnovers were really stupid but uh on Sunday night that that was the only reason that game was even close yeah, but if he does play elite football, you know, those moments to, that, that kind of catch your eye and you see why Dak is Dak. So uh, give him, he got his contract. Now he's getting some credit. We'd love to see it. Uh, let's move on to DMV showdown. We got the Washington Commanders taking on the Ravens. This is at Baltimore. Baltimore minus six and a half in this one. The total 52 and a half. We get Lamar versus Jaden Daniels. This is going to be a fun game. Who do you like in this one? Yeah, the Joe House classic, the Beltway battle. Uh, <laughs> right. 
How do you not bet the under, uh, you know, as crazy as it sounds, because these defenses have looked very vulnerable. The offenses are two of the three best in the league. I get it. But like this is the two. This is still NFL 2024. So many things have to go right to go over 53 to get a game like you got with Cincinnati and Washington or Baltimore and Cincinnati. Right. And I get it. We all watch those games because they were like incredible back and forth battles. But 52 and a half is in this modern NFL, like games totaled over 50 for the last three or four years have gone under like six. I don't have the exact number in front of me, but it's like 62 something, 65%. Like it's just very hard um, with these defenses taking away explosives to make that work. Last one, Cincinnati taking on the New York Giants. Giants plus three and a half, the total 48 and a half. Who do you like here? Cincinnati. Can they figure out how to win a football game? That is the big question. I don't know. Actually, that's a great question. Uh, I wish I could figure that out i bet them to make the playoffs and a couple weeks ago and they've had two just heartbreakers uh since but mm-hmm. uh, i'm gonna go with the team total over for cincinnati it's just been my tried and true play i mentioned it on paper chasers with austin gale a couple weeks ago mentioned it last week in my in my column like last three weeks i've just kind of been like you know i'm kind of tired of predicting this Bengals defense to do anything. They're, they're pretty useless. In fact, they're so bad, it actually helps the team total because Cincinnati has to keep throwing the ball all over the yard. And the Giants secondary had a good performance last week, but I, I mean, I've seen them get torched more than enough to know that I don't really trust this coverage unit. It's just such a massive difference. The quality of the, the Giants secondary versus Jamar and T, it's like, good luck, right? Especially with the mm-hmm. Bengals offensive line being better than it's been in the past. So that that's where I like the team total over on the Bengals. And that, that's been my tried and true play. I'm going to stick to it. Yeah. It's uh, we keep going back to the well with Cincinnati. It is what it is. Uh, it's hard not to believe in them when you see them play good football, but then for whatever reason, they can't figure it out in the win and loss column. One last question before I let you go. Is Daniel Jones the best quarterback in New York right now? Uh, you know, is that is that a bold thing to say? Ooh. How do you feel? Does Josh <laughs> I mean, Allen count? No, he doesn't count, right? Josh, so, Josh um, Allen, I guess, is in New York State. I'm saying New York City. Uh, we, right. we got a battle between two quarterbacks. Maybe three if you get DeVito in there. But uh, how do you feel about Daniel Jones? He looked pretty good. Teron Taylor week. is still the Jets' backup, right? That's he might, true. He might have some juice. Uh, that's true. Uh, that's really tough. Um, I'll be honest. I think it's gone under the radar how good Jones has been because neighbors has taken all the spotlight, but the performance last week against Seattle was impressive. Uh, but I would still have to go with Rogers. Okay. I just wanted to, I just yeah. wanted to check in, make sure. And I wasn't, the fact I, that we had to, I had to think <laughs> right. about it. Yeah. Right. It's kind of worth something. something. Yeah. It's good for Daniel Jones. Uh, Anthony DeBundo, where can we find all your work? And then we'll let you go enjoy the rest of your day, man. Yeah, I'll be podcasting in the Ringer Gambling feed. I'll be talking Phillies with Shio Kapadia on the Philly special and uh, writing every week about the NFL. It's been a blast, and thank you for having me on. Of course, man. Anytime. We'll have you back on the show, and uh, we'll be right back after the break. There you have it for another edition of Through the Ringer. Shout out to Cousin Sal, as always, for being on the show. And appreciate Anthony DeBundo for joining us. We we uh, we love talking to him. We're going to have him back on the show, as always. And we appreciate you, the people, for tuning in to Through the Ringer. And we will see you next week.